Good evening, and welcome. We're glad. I'm, I'm, I'm glad to be here. Are you glad to be here? My name is Tom, and I am a grateful follower of Jesus Christ, who is powerless over drugs and alcohol and sex and all sorts of stuff. But today, by the grace of God, I can choose recovery. Amen? Thank you. Let's start our time together with a brief prayer. Father, we all come to you realizing that it is by your grace, and yet that is enough. We sing your grace is enough. We pray that your grace is enough. So, Father, we acknowledge our need, and we pray your presence. Be our teacher, be our guide, be a spirit of hope, a spirit of love, all because of your grace. And I ask this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Everybody in agreement said? Amen. Oh, it is so good to be back. It is so good to be back. You know, last Thursday, I got a call from Pastor Sherry asking me if I would fill in for tonight's lesson. Well, in a moment of weakness, I agreed. And the <laughs> only guideline she offered was that it should be uplifting. Well, that sounds like a pretty good way to go these days. And I started to pray about it. And the very next night, Friday night, Kip led this men's small group and we talked about the promises at the small group that follow the ninth step in the book Alcoholics Anonymous. And I had pretty much already decided to use the promises as tonight's topic. So, sounded good so far. The only problem is that as I was starting to prepare this lesson, I remember hearing Becky O's testimony last week. Was anybody here for that? It was a tremendous testimony. And what kept coming to my mind was this word hope. And I'm not talking about just a little bit. I'm talking about overwhelmingly, won't go away, will not leave you alone, hope. And that's not a bad thing. Well, I got to thinking about it. I said, okay, well, hope and the promises, there's no contradiction there. But to tie them directly together in one message or one lesson might be a little bit much. But I couldn't get it out of my mind. I couldn't get the promises. I couldn't get the hope. I could not get it all out of my mind. And since I couldn't get past the idea, I said, okay, here we go. That's what we're going to try to do tonight. And I hope God brings a blessing to all of us from this. So let's kick this off and let's kick off by starting talking about hope. Hope is a good word. It's a wonderful, precious word. But I find that we tend to maybe misuse it just a little bit. Now, remember, a simple definition of the word hope is an anticipation of something good. That's ultra simple, but it pretty much covers it. And the thing of it is, though, we use that word hope for an awful lot of stuff. We hope we get the job we want or the relationship we want. We hope we get the financial resources we want and need. We hope the weather is good for some special event. We hope for peace, world peace, peace in our neighborhood. We hope the pizza is hot when it gets here. You see, we hope for all sorts of things, and sometimes it works out, sometimes it doesn't. And I'm not criticizing those use of the word hope. That's just fine. But they do not capture what I am talking about tonight. You see, most of the time when we talk about those things, it all depends on somebody doing something that we want them to do. That tends to be the nature of those kinds of things. And then there's also the totally false hope that we occasionally get into. Been there, done that, you? You know, we treat our loved ones badly and hope that they don't mind or that they understand. We don't take care of ourselves very well and then hope we don't get sick. 
We ignore the simple suggestions in recovery and hope we don't relapse. That kind of stuff is a lot more like denial than it is hope. And we've done that, all of us. If you're saying no, I think maybe you're in denial, but that's just me. You see, there are a hundred ways we can use this word hope casually and sometimes callously. But what I'm trying to share with you tonight, the hope that I'm trying to uh, remind us all of is what happens when all of my efforts have failed and there does not appear to be any way that anything can good can come from my situation, from my hurts, my habits, my hang-ups, my addictions, afflictions, and compulsive behaviors to when I get in such a... I have no way out. That is the kind and the level of hope that I'm trying to remind us of tonight. In Becky's testimony last week, she talked about coming to a point in her life where she felt hopeless. And it caused her to finally surrender to God. And that led her to start taking the suggestions she heard in the rooms of recovery. You see, she did not specifically mention the word hope that I can recall in that part of her story, but that comparatively sudden change from hopeless floundering to a purposeful recovery just screamed out the word hope to me. That is what I heard, and it was wonderful the way she shared that. And when I share my own story of recovery... I tell folks that right right before I came into recovery, I I should say was brought into recovery, I was helpless and I didn't want help. I was hopeless and I didn't want hope. My honest prayer to God at that time was, God, I'm done. I want out. Please end my life now. And then something changed. I got on a bicycle, rode to the detox that I had been to before. I even went to the AA meeting that had that, they had that night, and I had been to them before. And in that meeting, I saw the beginnings of hope, and that was what began my journey in recovery. It was by God's grace, not by my efforts. And it wasn't because I asked but because I gave up, because I surrendered. And it wasn't because I asked for hope. It was because God knew that that is what I needed. And that led me to start thinking this one thing, and it's going to be on the screen because I think it is important. The hope we're talking about tonight is a gift from God. Pastor and author Randy Alcorn presents it this way from an article in February. He says, there is a gift God has given his people in all ages that has enabled them not just to hold on, but to experience fulfillment even in times of great difficulty. And that gift is hope. We receive hope not because we deserve it, but because we need it. We receive hope not by the good things we have done, but because of the good good things that God wants to do in us. The Apostle Paul, an amazing follower of Jesus, we have gave us a, a little prayer to point to where our source of hope is. It says, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. That's from Romans 15, 13. He wrote this and it appears to me that this is a prayer or a benediction and he is reminding us that the source of hope is God himself. The hope that changes lives. Hope is very much similar to God's grace. It is a gift because of God's love. And that word hope is used in the big book 43 times. You know the book Alcoholics Anonymous? It is used in the Bible over 130 times. So yes, hope is foundational to recovery. 
And yet here's the amazing thing. I believe it is probably one of God's underappreciated gifts. Because you see, hope is a gift that I must use in order to realize what God has intended it for. You see, if I, when I it was in that detox and I experienced, and this was real, and I remember to this day when I experienced hope for the first time, if I had not continued on in that path, in the path of recovery, then that gift of hope would have been wasted. It would have been just another funny feeling. It would have been a delusion. It was hope that led me into recovery. And my way of appreciating that hope, my way of truly saying I'm grateful to that hope is to allow that hope to lead me to where God wants me to be. And guess what? And I'm going to get all mundane on you because here in this Christ-powered recovery called CR, we are given a clear and definite pathway for us to realize the fruits that we see from the gift of hope. Anybody want to guess what that pathway is? Oh, come on. It is the five essentials we just read a few minutes ago. That's right. Jesus, trust him. Twelve steps, work them. Sponsor, get one. Meetings, attend them. Service, do it. You see, it is hope that leads me to continue to practice the five essentials today in my life. And what I have discovered is that as I am growing in my trust in Jesus and I continue to work the steps and continue to invite my sponsor and others to walk through this journey with me, I continue to attend meetings and I continue to serve others to the best of my ability, that hope has done nothing but grow. It has grown in dark times and in the good times, in successes and in failures. And I've, I have discovered that along with hope, and here's one of the beautiful parts of this thing, along with hope because of the work and because of God's continued grace, I have begin, been receiving faith and I'm experiencing God's love in ways I would have never thought possible prior to coming into recovery and even prior to coming to Christ. Hope is a precious gift. Hope is worth enjoying. Hope is worth appreciating by following where it leads us. And it is all by God's grace, but I am called to co cooperate with that grace. And I got some bad news for some of you. You're called to cooperate with it, too. I believe that same hope that has brought myself and so many hundreds of thousands of people into recovery is available to anyone if they're willing to surrender what God has for them. But we have to cooperate with it. We have to participate in it. And working the 12 steps is one of the ways we live out God's hope. You see, we, we tend to fall into the trap of thinking, well, I've got to work these steps. I've got to do this. And it, we tend to, tend to treat it as a list of got-tos instead of an opportunity because the 12 steps are not a, a drudgery I have to get through. Working the steps with a sponsor is a huge part of our journey into a truly new and hopeful life. What that is truly what a lot of this is about. It's about hope. It's about a living, real hope. And throughout this journey, we see promises at each step. If you read through the literature, the, the big book and the 12 and 12 and the various, at each step, somewhere in that step, you're going to find a promise. 
And those promises are there as a nourishment for the hope we have been given. And yeah, every once in a while, they are a tool that God uses to give us the gift of hope. See, they remind us these promises that we read fairly often around here and definitely a lot in the traditional 12-step meetings. Those promises are a sign of God's faithfulness. And leading into the promises, there are somewhere in the neighborhood of 150 promises in the book Alcoholics Anonymous. Did you know that? There are several thousand promises in the Bible. And I'm going to make a statement here that I believe all of them are given, they are God's promises to us. And I believe that. Now, let's remember, I mean, promises are kind of like hope. We kind of get misuse that stuff. We live in a world full of promises. Advertiser make, advertisers make promises. Politicians make promises. Spouses make promises to each other. We promise ourselves and others these famous promises that we are never going to be indulging or held captive by our addictions, afflictions, or compulsive behaviors ever again. Anybody ever made that promise? How'd you do on keeping that? Nah, me either. But you see, I like to believe that even these promises made in good faith with good intentions. But we are all flawed people. We start out our program by saying we are powerless. True? So we are flawed. So it's really hard for us to trust the promises made by people. I know it's really hard for me to trust. It took me a long time to trust people's promises because I had started to know me, and my promises weren't that good. So that's why I emphasize and I say tonight, the promises we receive, those, the ones we're going to go through in a minute, and the ones in the Bible, all of the promises we receive from that, these are God's promises. And these promises give, nourish, restore and renew on an ongoing basis hope. You know, we could spend years talking about the promises. Like I said, there are thousands of them in the Bible and 150 of them in the big book, according to one count. And I hope we do have those kind of discussions. And I hope that hope is a regular part of our discuss discussions. Remember, Alcoholics Anonymous says this, we share our experience, strength, and... That's right. That's what it says. We share our experience and hope. And so tonight I'd like to just real quickly review these promises that follow step nine. To remind, but I want to review them and you can either listen or follow along. They're on the screen. But I want to look at them not as a checklist of, well, I got that, I got that, I got that. I don't got that. They are all the evidence of God's love and grace, and they are a source of renewed and nourishment for hope. So I'm going to read these, and again, if you want to follow along and read them with, you can. And they begin, if we are painstaking about this phase of our development, and that is referring to the ninth step specifically and all the steps before that in general. It says, we will be amazed before we are halfway through. We are going to know a new freedom and a new happiness. We will not regret the past nor wish to shut the door on it. We will comprehend the word serenity <coughs> and we will know peace. No matter how far down the scale we have gone, we will see how our experience can benefit others. That feeling of uselessness and self-pity will disappear. We will lose interest in selfish things and gain interest in our fellows. Self-seeking will slip away. Our whole attitude and outlook on life will change. 
fear of people and, and economic insecurity will leave us. We will intuitively know how to handle situations which used to baffle us. We will suddenly realize that God is doing for us what we could not do for ourselves. Are these extravagant promises? They are being fulfilled among us, sometimes quickly, sometimes slowly. They will always materialize if we work for them. Work. And if we're going to use the word work, let's not forget the word grace. But the question that it asked there is, are these extravagant promises? Well, when I came into recovery, I didn't think they were extravagant. I thought they were impossible. I thought, and I remember thinking this, and it was actually true, I thought there is nothing I can do to make all that happen. And I was right. Apart from God's power and God's grace, they are impossible. And yes, I still think they are extravagant because they rely upon God, not, on our, not strictly on our own ability. It says that if you work for them, and if we're painstaking, if we are, before, we will be amazed before we're halfway through. Yes, we do all that. But apart from the power and the grace of God, the promises for me don't happen. But even knowing that, and this is what is the great wonder, I have seen God's promises come true in my life even before I actually believed it was possible. Sometime quickly, some slowly. But they have materialized as I, as I have placed my hope and trust in God and done the footwork we talk about in the steps and in the rest of the essentials. You see, in my lives and in the lives of others, so many others, I've seen these promises manifested in times of success and in times of failure. And I've had both. I've seen these promises shown up in times of tremendous happiness and horrible loss. You see, these promises can be present in social upheaval, terrorist attacks, or pandemics. They are present on sunny days and stormy days. They can be present in our lives no matter our circumstances because they are based on God's love and faithfulness. So the only reason for this lesson, as far as I can say, see, wasn't to share anything new with you. I think you've heard it all before. If you haven't, well, I'm glad you're here. But tonight I want to encourage you and the guy I look at in the mirror to stay engaged with God, continue the action, Continue the trusting. Continue growing in the hope that God's promises are there for every human being who is willing to accept them, no matter where you're coming from. And that I can truly join with the Apostle Paul in this action by being joyful in hope, patient in affliction, we don't like that part too much, but faithful in prayer. That is, for me, a conversation about living life on life's terms in God's world. And doing this in the hope of God's promises, we get another promise. We get a promise of God's hope. And it's from Proverbs. And it says, there is surely a future hope for you. And your hope will not be cut off. It's Proverbs 23, 18. God promises us hope. I'm going to close this part of the, the, tonight, the message. And I'm going to close this with a, a rewritten version of that uh, uh, verse from uh, Romans 15 wrote it so that we could pray it tonight. And remember, it goes like this. It says, God of hope, we pray that you will fill us with all joy and peace as we trust in you so that we may overflow with hope 
by the power of the Holy Spirit. And all in agreement said, Amen. Amen. As the band comes back, and hopefully they will come back. <laughs> we open this time and we take this time for an invitation. It's an invitation to respond not to anything I said, but what God may have said to you. Maybe you would like a, a renewal of hope. Maybe you need a little dose of hope. It's good to pray the prayer we just prayed, but I think God wants to hear from you in your own words. So we invite you either to the altar or at your seat. Make an altar out of your seat. And we invite you to come to God and have this conversation with God. Ask and you shall receive. Knock and it will be opened. So we invite you to ask. And if you would like to come to the altar, there are six spaces. They are each socially distanced. And when you are done at the altar, somebody will be there to wipe it so everything stays nice and sanitary and clean. We invite you now to come. We only would do with it.